We have uh, Sarah Hample here. Um, Dr. Sarah Hample is a pediatrician in the Center for Children's Healthy Lifestyles and Nutrition at Children's Mercy, Kansas City, and a professor, professor of pediatrics at the <coughs> University of Missouri. So um, we are so excited to hear about uh, Dr. Hample's innovative projects going on at Children's Mercy. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the chance to talk today, and um, as you all know, these uh, types of things that happen on behalf of kids and families in Missouri never happen alone. This is a, um, has been a really great partnership with many stakeholders um, in the state, and I'll be reviewing um, those with you as I go along. So I want to um, talk about, um, first of all, some of the factors we have looked at over the past five years or so um, in Missouri that led to some recommendations to help treat obesity but also prevent it in kids. We'll review the rationale for the recommendations and our progress so far. And then um, kind of our, our long view um, because we know that, um, that again, health doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't just happen in a hospital or a clinic. Health happens where kids are and in the community. And so we really have to look at how can we start adopting more of a chronic care model and um, more of um, a recognition and appreciation for the fact that um, kids live in neighborhoods and communities and go to schools and parents are in workplaces and how do we impact them at each of those levels. I wanna speak about um, how we're kind of integrating our overall activities through a council that several of you may be members of, um, the Missouri Council on Activity and Nutrition and then um, eventually how we hope to um, integrate more formally um, activities through centers of excellence for uh, the care of children with obesity. So as you all know, news to you, obesity rates are rising in kids um, and adults, and so the youth are on the bottom there. And um, although we've seen a little bit of leveling off in our young kids um, in the state of Missouri, um, nationally as well, but if we look at kids with severe obesity, those uh, prevalence rates are increasing. And so we're really concerned um, about those kids who already have obesity and who need um, evidence-based treatment as well as to prevent obesity. And so if we think about um, the fact that not only does obesity track into adulthood, but the comorbidities or the complications of obesity also track um, very, very closely into adulthood, it makes um, good sense that we need to be preventing and treating obesity early in kids to hopefully um, either uh, decrease the likelihood of the child becoming obese or if they're already obese, help them get toward a healthier weight or at least help decrease or po pot potentially um, eliminate comorbidities that they're already um, experiencing. The IOM and others have suggested that maybe we ought to look regionally um, and look at uh, regions of the U.S. with higher prevalence and you can see there in the uh, darker purple that um, our four state region um, here in region seven are among the um, states with the highest prevalence for um, obesity and complications of obesity. So about five years ago, we had the opportunity to convene a subcommittee of the Children's Services Commission in the state to look specifically at childhood obesity treatment and prevention. And we got to work with um, a number of stakeholders from across the state, some of our universities, healthcare institutions, as well as some of our state um, organizations that, um, that, are, that represent healthcare professionals like the Missouri chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Because this was a broader effort, we again not wanted to, didn't want to just look at treatment, but we also wanted to look at prevention and where are those places where kids go, school, childcare. So we um, we had a number of state agencies involved as well as a, a lead childcare agency in the state and funders. Um, and really, the work wouldn't have been possible without um, the uh, a dedicated. Uh, kind of wrangler or um, facilitator of the meetings, someone who really helped keep us on track um, and helped us um, identify what were our goals early on and continue to move toward those goals. And then a report writer um, who was uh, facilitated through um, <clears throat> through the grants was, was able to put a report together for us as well as an executive summary. So we met monthly in 2014 and again, as you all well know, grappled with this very complex issue of obesity in kids and how do you 
possibly select areas for focus in, um, an, in a condition, a disease that has so many etiologies and so many contributors. So we early on, through the help of the facilitator, established what were going to be our guiding principles and, um, and went from there. So um, our, our uh, goals at that time were that whatever we um, recommended needed to be actionable, it needed to be feasible, and at that time we said two years, and we were definitely green with that. Um, definitely we're still working on these after five years, um, but they would be evidence-based and they'd be um, having potential to have statewide impact. Those were kind of our, our four guiding principles. And the recommendations that were made, I'll go over each of these, I'll focus um, on how hopefully also these ultimately will be woven together and at least connected so that we can have um, collaboration between the different areas. But the, the five recommendations you see there in front of you, and again, I'll go over each of these. Um, but we felt that also we needed to have a, a central um, place where we could keep track of how these recommendations are being implemented and are they being implemented the way that um, is the most evidence-based and how can we remain evidence-based with our approaches in the state. So that's the Commission um, on Child Health and Wellness. So at the end of that year, we um, together put together a report for the Children's Services Commission that was released more broadly. Um, the link to the report is here. Some of you may have seen it. Also, there's an executive summary um, that's a, that is um, a little um, more easy to, to go through and just kind of get um, a thumb, thumbnail view of what, what the recommendations were. So the one that I've been the most involved in is the treatment recommendation. I'll speak to that probably a little bit more than the other recommendations, but I wanted, wanted you to be aware of um, also just kind of the history of how these things happen. And so um, none of it, again, would happen without dedication of partners across the state that really were wanting to see improvement in these various domains. The treatment one tended to maybe take off a little earlier than the others because Missouri Health Net, the Missouri Health Net Division um, through the Department of um, Social Services really wanted to do more for treating adults and kids that were insured by Medicaid in our state. And so they um, were looking for help already. It was really a win-win situation where we um, wanted, um, also we had a great desire to serve the most underserved kids in our state, um, which are the kids that they insure. So it, it really worked out well. And our initial um, recommendation is, like many things, not the way it ultimately turned out, but it was pretty close. And so our original recommendation is that um, children be um, who were overweight or obese be offered evidence-based, family-centered, multi-component weight reduction programs through all Medicaid plans and that they that uh, services be reimbursed in community settings or healthcare settings. Um, I want to give a little bit of background for how we came to that recommendation. Um, originally in 2010 and then reaffirmed in 2017, were um, recommendations by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. And they recommended that, um, first of all, that clinicians need to be screening kids for obesity, definitely kids ages six and older. There's mounting evidence for uh, screening and, and treating in kids that are younger, but the evidence is just not at the level yet or, at, or was not at that time that they felt comfortable um, lowering the age but um, six and older and offer or refer them to comprehensive intensive behavioral interventions to promote improvements in weight status. And how that, um, what that really means is uh, at least 26 contact hours, contact hours with the, the patient and their parent over a period of at least, uh, or up to a year to improve weight status. And there are a number of different, um, again, analyses and systematic reviews that supported that higher dose that basically there is kind of a dose response relationship such that the um, more contact, the higher the dose with the child and parent, the more likely uh, the child is to, to reach a healthier weight. And not just weight, but other outcomes as well that we're concerned about. So the model that we chose to go with actually um, has been around for 30 plus years, um, family-based behavioral treatment. We have the stoplight there because one of the kind of the hallmarks of that treatment is the stoplight diet. Um, and so starting, you know, kind of on the left of, of, of the slide there, Dr. Lynn Epstein um, founded or 
kind of created the family-based behavioral treatment program and then um, over the years added components to it, tested each of those um, components and for their effectiveness and then additional researchers including um, one of my colleagues Dr. Denise Wolfley at Washington University in St. Louis added to um, again some of the components and what could be um, could be added to a treatment program that would really increase its efficacy. So um, this this type of line of research has been going on for over 30 years and it continues. And it demonstrates long-lasting effects, so not just at the end of the treatment period, but afterwards up to 30 months up beyond that um, at times that kids will maintain a decreased BMI Z-score. And that's just a better indicator for us of how far away the child is from a healthier weight. And in particular, um, Dr. W one of Dr. Wolfley's studies demonstrated that in that maintenance period, a social facilitation approach really helped um, maintain those improvements. So really taking into consideration what, what kind of support was around the child and family afterwards and could they um, grow in their, in their skills of, of bringing along others with them and, and not getting um, waylaid or sidetracked by friends perhaps that were um, that were observing a, a less healthy diet for instance um, but but gaining in their social facilitation skills really aided the weight loss maintenance and in addition this is something we see clinically as well that when parents do well they, those are the parents that have the kids that do well so there is a secondary benefit to the parents as well as the other siblings in the family because we really stress a family-based approach that it's not just the child singling out the child to do um, eat and drink in a certain way and to be more active, but it has to be a family-based approach. So there are, um, again, other benefits that have been demonstrated um, for family-based behavioral treatment, not the least of which is that it's more cost-effective um, than separate treatment. So again, we can get some secondary benefit and some additional um, public health effect with, um, with being able to help parents and other siblings achieve a healthier weight or prevent them from becoming overweight. The additional benefit of it is that it can be implemented in multiple settings, so um, not just um, strictly research-based um, settings, but also primary care-based settings have been um, effective locations for this treatment. So in terms of um, expanding the reach, um, things that may uh, affect Missouri or that are affecting Missouri right now, Dr. Wolfley has a couple of um, different federally funded trials. One um, is working with families in St. Louis as well as um, some other communities across the U.S. that's really the first large scale trial um, compared to usual care in primary settings. That's called the PLAN trial. And then secondly, um, she has a, a study um, through PCORI that is um, comparing standard care in primary care offices that is up to date with the latest pediatric obesity primary care management versus um, that with family-based behavioral therapy. And um, a number of families, not just in St. Louis, but actually in the Columbia, Missouri area are gonna be um, and are participating in this. The additional thing that's nice about this is that, um, that she and, and her colleagues are really interested in how can we get other stakeholders on board and recognizing that for the sustainability of these types of programs, we have to have um, buy-in and engagement from payers specifically. So a few challenges that we faced um, to begin with was first of all that, that family-based therapy was not a covered benefit at the time where we, um, when we started talking about this new benefit and that we have not that many treatment options and the other three states in our region really are also largely rural and so the, um, there is starting to be more and more uh, support from academic hubs like MU and um, University of Nebraska for instance for teleecho and um, telehealth options to help um, in reaching primary care providers, but also children and families with treatment. But overall, we're still dealing with a, you know, a lot of um, areas of our states that are not reached in terms of access to evidence-based treatment. There are also not too many models out there about how you do this um, and how can we 
Um, also, make sure that we're strongly partnering with our state um, healthcare professional organizations. In addition, obesity is underdiagnosed um, in kids, especially, and I'll um, go over that in a minute. So, payers sometimes don't see it as an issue because it's not coming through on their claims data, um, the obesity diagnosis. And finally, there's no national certification. So, um, in order for Medicaid to be able to certify a provider to deliver a particular treatment, they have to see that that individual is certified and we didn't have that at the beginning. Pluses though, um, pros for our state were that we had um, strong interest in this from state level organizations. We had an established coalition of multiple state stakeholders, uh, MOCAN. We had an existing um, disease process, autism in kids, that, that had traveled um, some of the same uh, ground that we had only about 10 years prior to us. So there have been centers of excellence um, or centers for the care of children with autism that have been set up in our state and they continue to be funded um, well by our uh, state legislator, less legislature. So we have a model um, to try to um, learn from. And then finally, um, the WashU team um, was recognized as national experts in family-based behavioral treatment. So <clears throat> related to our, um, our state with, with Medicaid, um, again, very strong partner, over 9,000 um, participants in Missouri Medicaid and roughly three-fourths of them are managed with Medicaid managed care and about a fourth of them in a more traditional fee-for-service model. About two-thirds of those individuals are kids. And so that was, again, our primary interest. The Medicaid benefit that will be coming out later this year is actually both for adults and kids, so there's kind of two separate benefits, but the one that we were working on was the one with kids um, because that was our primary interest. And even among adults, we know that healthcare costs are increased for adults with obesity compared to normal weight um, beneficiaries of Medicare, Medicaid rather, and that we're um, that it's a costly, um, costly individual effect. And I never want to lose sight of that um, because that's why I do what I do um, is because I see the individual toll that this takes on kids and families. But there's also a tremendous um, state level and national impact on healthcare cost. So um, Missouri Health Net Division um, convened um, a number of uh, us and others in the state to provide some input and we formed a little work group and gave them um, some guidance, but they really did the majority of the work to do the cost modeling um, so that they could identify how many kids were we potentially talking about, what would the services be, what requirements would the providers have before they could be reimbursed, what codes would be used, and what could be the projected savings. And so, um, fortunately, I mean, it, it, these things take time, as you all know, but the uh, draft rule was released at the end of, or the beginning of September of 2018, open for a period of 30 days for public comment, and then um, currently we're, we're um, Missouri Medicaid is in the process of going through the comments and deciding if they're going to revise their proposed rule. Um, <clears throat> And so just to give you an idea of what are the elements of the, uh, the new treatment benefit, that it would be, um, first of all, for adults modeled after the Medicare benefit for adults with obesity, and that intensive behavioral therapy would be, um, would be offered. And for kids, it's that same model, except it's more family-based behavioral therapy. It can be, there, there is a certain number of hours covered for individual treatment of these kids, but most of the treatment would be occurring in a group setting. Um, minimum of 26 hours for kids, again, modeling after the USPSTF recommendation. And the opportunity to receive a little bit of additional treatment in the last six months of the plan year if certain benchmarks are made. And so um, for kids, this, this will apply for kids insured by Medicaid ages five and above, um, really ages five to 19. They age out of Medicaid um, when they turn 20 and they have to have um, a BMI at or above the 95th percentile. And in the initial modeling, they have um, identified what are the codes to be used um, and so forth. And the, the other neat thing about this, I think, and we'll see if it actually happens, but the way they did their modeling was that the savings from treating adults with obesity that will um, build up with Medicaid will actually pay for the childhood treatment 
With kids, fortunately, we sometimes don't see those complications of obesity until their late teens or their adulthood. So it's, it's sometimes hard to demonstrate what is that return on investment. So the cost, the upfront cost of treating kids are higher because there are not that many, thankfully, comorbidities to treat and, um, and reap um, financial benefit from. But in adults, um, definitely comorbidities are more common. And so treating those comorbidities and treating the obesity will build up savings. Um, that is what Medicaid projects. And so um, we'll, you know, it remains to be seen if this is borne out. But um, because of how I know that the other three states uh, deal with this too, but there are um, definitely tight budgets at the state level with Medicaid, they really couldn't do um, Put together a benefit that was going to cost the state. They had to keep um, the benefit as cost neutral as possible. And so um, that, that was the beauty, I think, of this is that um, their modeling demonstrated that the savings uh, that would build up from adult treatment would pay for the uh, treatment of kids. So the provider requirements also um, had to be defined, and this was, again, a, a pretty big uh, learning curve for people like me who have um, not a lot of understanding about how, how uh, insurance companies work and how um, benefits get decided, but, but provider types are the uh, two that you see there. So behavioral health specialists, which would include licensed behavioral, um, licensed clinical social workers, licensed professional counselors, or licensed psychologists, and then registered dietitians are the provider types. And again, a certification is needed um, for that. There is a national certification for dietitians for childhood obesity medical nutrition therapy. However, there is not for family-based behavioral therapy, and that presented an additional dilemma for us. So um, one of the things that I've been the most involved in is figuring out how do we prepare providers, specifically the, the uh, behavioral health providers and developing a certification program for them. Um, what I've been mostly involved in is on the medical side, but um, we'll try to relay what Dr. Wilfley and others have done on the behavioral health side. So preparing providers, because it's great to have the benefit, but if it's not going to be utilized, then um, that's going to give a pretty negative message to Missouri Medicaid and the, the state that funds it saying that, you know, maybe this isn't uh, such a desirable benefit. So it's really in our best interest to um, have a prepared workforce once this benefit is activated. So this is kind of an ideal state of how we think things may work. Um, for the benefit in that the primary care provider would see a patient with obesity, recommend, um, begin recommended assessment and management in the primary care setting, but the, then also screen them for their interest in a more intensive family-based program. They would refer to the dietitian and the behavioral therapist for initial individual evaluations. And also we wanna keep the primary care provider in the loop. And in fact, they're kind of the, uh, one of the initial identifiers of these kids and families. And also we'll have to report back to Medicaid after the initial treatment um, program has completed. So we need to um, develop a care coordination um, method as well. So the recommendations on an individual level would be shared and then they would begin family-based behavioral group therapy and around six months have a reevaluation. And again, uh, coordination of care would occur hopefully uh, with the uh, three providers and then the decision would be made, can they go on to receive additional, um, a little bit of additional um, FBT and medical nutrition therapy. The other good thing about this benefit is if a child doesn't make it through that first six months um, for a variety of reasons, we've, we've done family-based group um, treatment ourselves at Children's Mercy for about 12 years now, almost 13, and we, uh, we have uh, knowledge of the fact that life happens for these families. They, they don't always um, have the capacity to continue with the treatment for a variety of reasons. So if the child is not able to continue in treatment, they can re-enroll in the next plan year. To build training capacity or treatment capacity, um, we've taken kind of a three-prong approach um, among the, the providers that you see on the slide. But first of all, we convened a healthcare advisory group to guide us on how do we recruit professionals for this type of training and how do we spread the, the training um, once we've piloted it. So we um, have developed three three types of training and we're in the midst of um, delivering the trainings right now and um, developing a sustainability plan to reach more providers. What I've been doing um, over the past couple years is 
going out and training um, primary care providers um, in person or bringing them to uh, Children's Mercy to be trained. And these are just some of the things that I've been reviewing with the medical providers, um, their role and how important it is for them to um, maintain a evidence-based approach for primary care-based management of obesity, and then also offering them additional resources and continuing medical education credit for the training. Um, our partners in this um, have been um, locally our own um, integrated care uh, network through Children's Mercy because there's an existing learning collaborative among providers that they have. And in addition, we've partnered with MU, specifically the health um, communications um, department to help us design material for healthcare providers to help um, attract them to the training. And then they're gonna be looking at um, pieces for parents as well. Um, and then uh, again, the people we've targeted are those that first of all see a high percentage of kids with Medicaid. Secondly, maybe in a setting where they might have a dietitian and a behavioral health provider with them. Um, again, knowing that that's not going to reach um, all the providers, but at least for this pilot, thinking about where are those FQHCs and safety net clinics where uh, the primary care provider would be most likely to already have some contact with a dietitian and a behavioral health provider. So we've trained. Um, Less than 200 have gone through the full training, but over 200 have um, gone through the training. And then in addition, I've had opportunities through our state level conferences of Missouri AAP and, uh, and others to present information about the benefit during our, our pilot grant. And then our benefit or our treatment for medical providers is now online so that um, if they want to take it asynchronously and um, get continuing ed credit for it, they can. The dietitian um, training um, has been kicked off as well. We've done about three trainings, actually four now, um, with um, probably around 65 um, dietitians. And they have been great in assisting us in, first of all, a needs assessment for their own training and um, looking at helping us with recruitment. So we've been able to present at their state um, meeting last year and then also have done um, a couple of other in-person trainings and that training is, is also um, being put online. The family-based behavioral uh, treatment training was a little more complicated. Um, first of all, there's the no national certification, but secondly, because those individuals are the ones that are delivering the bulk of the treatment, um, 26 hours worth in the first six months, it just makes sense that the training would be longer. Um, and so it's a two-day training. And um, then there, because of um, the way that um, individuals are certified, they not only have to go through the training, they have to go through a period of supervision after the training so that um, their competence can be um, demonstrated. And so we have gotten a little bit of slower start with this. We're doing our second training um, later this month. But, um, but we see the, the need for how can we perpetuate this because it is, um, it is a very key element of the treatment benefit. And we know that this issue is competing with a lot of other behavioral health issues that behavioral health professionals are treating. We ha already have a lack of behavioral health professionals in our state, and I'm sure the same um, is probably true for our other three states in our region. So how do we um, ensure that we're gonna have an adequate workforce for this? I'm not sure we're gonna be able to ensure it, but we um, at least are, are getting a start. A little bit about our outcome evaluation, um, and I didn't mention before, but I will mention now that this has been a two-year pilot grant that we received from the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, now called the Health Forward Foundation, and they've been tremendously supportive of our efforts and also very willing for us to share our trainings outside of their service area. So. Um, that's been very appreciated. We're mainly looking at process outcomes, at least at this point, and because the benefit hasn't started yet, we, um, we have um, a chance to, to add some things here, but at least our initial thought was to start out with more uh, process level outcomes. One of the things I'll be looking at is does the rate of diagnosis even of obesity in kids increase with Missouri Medicaid? So we have a partnership with the Office of Social and Economic Data Analysis at MU, OCDA, um, and they're gonna help us track. Our initial look at this was 2.9% of kids across the state 
were diagnosed with obesity. We know that's very low. Um, the likelihood of kids with obesity in Missouri is around 17%. So there's a tremendous underdiagnosis, and so a first step would be helping increase diagnosis rates. So that being said, just to um, to uh, share some exciting news that just in the last week we found out that we received a grant from the CDC for the next five years that will help us um, put this into action on a wider scale. Um, package it for kids um, that we really feel are highest at risk for obesity, those kids that um, are in low income families, and then disseminate the, um, the package in Kansas City and in Joplin. So we're excited to get that off the ground, um, and the last couple years of that grant will really be dedicated to how do we um, take the lessons learned and develop more, um, more of a sustainable package, and that will involve definitely communication with, um, with payers. So um, again, we that are passionate about public health and kids um, understand that investing now saves health care dollars in the future, but this is not a view that's always shared among um, payers. And so how can we help, um, how can we, again, I, um, identify and acknowledge their concerns, but also um, help eventually bring uh, coverage to more kids across the state. Just from our, you know, from our uh, own clinical experience, we see about 83% of our kids in primary care are insured by Medicaid. Um, in our weight management clinics, it's a little bit lower than that, but still it's, it's the majority. And even the families that do have commercial insurance, a lot of times they're um, really barely getting by. Um, Due to a lot of different factors, so we really are hopeful that the um, that the coverage can be expanded to um, kids insured commercially. There's a couple of national initiatives going on, um, one through the American Heart Association um, and the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Uh, it doesn't it isn't occurring in in Missouri? I'm not sure about our other three uh, states. It's mainly been kind of in the east and southeast, but they've um, a number of. of commercial insurers in other states have agreed to cover um, four physician visits and four dietitian visits for kids with obesity in a year. And that evaluation of that is ongoing. And then a newer initiative called the My Healthy Weight Initiative, um, there have been around 10 or 12 national insurers that have signed up um, to be a part of that, which would really expand um, the treatment uh, coverage for kids with obesity even, even further. I want to now shift a little bit to the other recommendations and tell you kind of our rationale for those and um, what has happened with those. So the child care recommendation you see there on the screen, I think our, our driver um, for this was that we know, first of all, that risk begins early, even prenatally, for sure, um, and that kids, even at young age, kids who have obesity are more likely to carry that into their teenage years and then if they're um, carrying extra weight as a teen, it often follows them into adulthood. So our current regulations um, have not really been updated since the early 90s to reflect more new, newer evidence related to best practices in obesity prevention in childcare settings. So this recommendation really had to do with how can we identify those practices or those rules that are uh, overdue for an update, especially related to kids eating and activity during childcare. And, um, and in terms of the progress that's been made on that, again, um, a couple of key stakeholders in this have been DHSS, um, their, their child care unit, as well as Child Care Aware of Missouri. And they initially did uh, an analysis of stakeholders, including child care providers, to identify what were their priorities. And then in the last year, um, DHSS and MU Extension have gotten a grant through the CDC that um, is going to be able to empower or equip healthcare providers in the state um, more fully related to um, nutrition, up to date nutrition standards, and uh, they're closely working with the MOCAN Child Care Work Group on this. So I think, um, you know, I, I wish I could speak more to the um, extent of this, um, but I could certainly put you in contact with the people that are working on it if you have any further questions about the, the progress on the child care recommendation. Let me just say, too, um, mentioning the value of LPHAs to us um, can't be underemphasized. Um, 
when we first started working on the recommendations and had what we felt like was a good first draft, we held meetings. Um, one of them was here at the KCMO Health Department to present those recommendations and ask for public feedback. And our, our LPHAs were great partners to us in that effort, both here in uh, St. Louis, Columbia, and in Springfield. And in addition, you can see that, um, especially for this childcare effort, that LPHAs are gonna be involved in assisting um, with developing the, the venues for the coaching services and the, uh, the reach out outreach to child care providers. The school recommendation um, has taken off quite well. Um, again, it's been uh, because of the existing partnership and interest of MOCAN and DESE um, in our state Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, um, as well as uh, other state partners like, like Denise and BH, BJC that really um, help this recommendation get off the ground. And what's currently, um, in terms of, of the rationale, again, you all know, and I know um, I've looked at Platte County data too, I'm a Platte County resident, and the rates in Platte County in our four county or five county region here in the metro, they're among the highest for our preschoolers. Um, rates of obesity really jump up though when kids start school. And so um, that is in addition to the fact that I mentioned earlier that kids with obesity are getting heavier. Um, kids with severe obesity are getting, um, are, are, uh, there are increased numbers of kids with severe obesity. Um, not only does obesity affect kids individually, but it can also affect their, their uh, school uh, experience. Not just their school performance in terms of um, more missed days and, and so forth, but their experience in school. And I hear on a, every day I'm in clinic, I hear stories of kids um, being bullied by their peers um, for their appearance. And kids will avoid school. Um, they may lash out again um, at, at those peers who are their bullies. Um, they may become bullies themselves. So the, the issue of bullying is, is uh, tremendous. And, uh, and I think that uh, we, we offer as much as we can on the clinical level with connecting um, parents and kids with resources that we have. but, um, but it, it doesn't always get to the, the root issue, um, which are uh, root issues of the, of the bullying. So um, at any rate, sorry I got off track about that, but I really feel passionately for these kids. They really do suffer. And, uh, and, and if we can um, assist them to feel more confident and safe um, and welcomed at school, it's going to be of benefit to all of us. So, um, so DESE and DHSS um, and a number of other partners um, already have a good um, supportive infrastructure, but things needed to go further in terms of more of a dedicated staff person. So DESE in 2016 um, got a grant that they were able to hire a former PE teacher, um, Laura Beckman, who really has taken off um, very speedily um, as the director of health, PE, and wellness. And since then, um, DESE and DHSS have gotten another grant from CDC um, last year to implement um, a number of different things to directly or indirectly support kids with obesity in schools. Um, first of all, to look at um, how how the whole school, well, I can't say the new one used to, used to be a different model. Now it's one with a W and H's and S's and C's, and I can't think of what it is, but um, you all know what I'm talking about. To implement um, that model and, and a chronic disease model more in a, um, a school-based population, and then um, helping um, spread, you know, spread this from, I think initially they're looking for schools and, and best practices among school districts also to help empower other school districts that are just getting off the ground. And that's one of the benefits I would say of being in MOCAN um, is they have a, a schools work group, a child care work group, and um, organizations, school districts, um, nurses, others that want to know more about what improvements they can bring to their own community can come and, and see what else is being done across the state that they could potentially learn from, adapt to their unique situation and implement. So now Laura Beckman's in a different role. Um, she's acting director of Missouri Healthy Schools and there's another individual, um, David, who is the acting director of Health and PE. They've held a workshop. Um, they are additionally um, being able to um, participate on a national advisory board and bring those learnings back to Missouri. And um, finally, they're gonna continue doing the YRBS um, in our state through 
uh, DESE as well as the school health profile. So more about it, um, there's quite a bit on their website about it. I'd encourage you to go there. Um, an additional recommendation that we made was related to centers of excellence for not just treatment of kids with obesity, but also um, coordination of prevention and treatment efforts. So as a, as a um, weight management provider, I can say, and when I was a primary care provider, I felt this as well, I didn't always know what was going on in the community that might be able to support the kids and families that I saw. Um, I, I knew that, um, that their parents wanted to um, get them involved, but I wasn't always sure where to advise them to turn. And this is very, this remains true. And so one of the, um, one of the goals of eventual centers of excellence would be to help connect those that are working in the prevention um, realm with those that are working in the treatment realm more effectively so that we will know what each other is doing and be able to share care of these kids. Um, again, the, um, I mentioned the rationale with the Centers of Excellence for the Care of Kids with Autism that we modeled after, and in fact, um, one of the individuals that was key in that effort, Dr. Janet Farmer, I'm sure um, some of you may recognize her name. I believe she's retired now, but she has been a great help to us. She was involved in that initial effort with the autism centers and then um, had been in a role at MU more recently to help kind of bring together those that were working on obesity um, related issues. So she has been a great, um, a great guide for us. The current centers of um, excellence for the care of kids with autism are in, in four areas. There may be a, a fifth one now, but basically um, this was this preceded us by about 10 years. And we um, feel like the issue of obesity is, is somewhat similar and somewhat different. For one thing, um, there's also a range and level of severity with obesity, just like there is with autism. There is a complex etiology, and both require a multifaceted approach um, to prevention and treatment. Uh, sometimes, like mental health um, issues, obesity is stigmatizing. Um, and, and it's chronic. And so that uh, puts us at a bit of a disadvantage sometimes in gathering public support for, um, for efforts because a lot of people still want to blame the child or want to blame the family um, and or want to blame the school. And there's a lot of, you know, um, that kind of thing going on. But going back to the very complex model of obesity that I showed earlier, and I know you guys deal with this in the public health realm as well, it's very chronic and it's very complex and there's no one um, etiology. There are multiple and we all have to, to figure out how can we work best together if we're going to be able to benefit that child and that, uh, that child's health. Like autism, um, obesity in obesity, early intervention is best, um, but kids are often not identified in a timely way. So that um, it's it's changing a little bit, but um, a number of parents come into my clinic and say, "Well, my PCP told me I shouldn't really have been worried about his weight. They were he was just going to grow out of it." And so uh, part of what what we're trying to do is change that mindset that kids these days are not outgrowing their obesity, and so it's important to intervene early. Um, there's an inadequate number of providers to deliver treatment for autism. Um, that has improved greatly in the last 10 years, but um, definitely for the care of kids with obesity, that remains true. And there's, there's momentum um, on this issue. There's readiness for change in systems of care. So eventually, we would like to, um, again, kind of follow the model of centers of care for kids with autism and help develop a, a state and a regional network, um, perhaps work with um, with innovative methods of getting care and education out, such as through telehealth, and then um, figure out how we're going to be able to fund it. That's kind of the, the first question that we have to, to tackle. So eventually, this is what we would foresee the functions of um, Centers for Excellence for the Care of Kids with Obesity that they might look like. We've even thought further as to maybe one center might have more expertise in treatment, one center might have more expertise in prevention and prevention research, and how could we help um, share expertise across the state. So we've gotten a start on this again through the, the um, collaboration that we built through our Childhood Obesity Subcommittee, and then we've got several university partners that um, remain strong partners with us. 
Um, fi the final recommendation I'm going to speak about is this commission, this kind of what we initially termed an oversight commission, kind of morphed in, it's morphed several times now, all for the better, but um, a commission on child health and wellness that would serve as a, a means to not only monitor what is going on with the centers of excellence, but also what's happening um, on a statewide level in the prevention realm and how we can continue to engage stakeholders and remain evidence-based. So our, again, our rationale was the complexity of the issue, that we need collaboration, and that um, a commission could strengthen and align services and policy to support the efforts. So we reviewed the options um, for what this might look like starting in September 2017. We um, analyzed, selected the best option. We ultimately decided several months later that we need to kind of come under a organization that's already established that has many of these stakeholders at the table already, um, which was the Missouri Council on Activity, Activity and Nutrition, and we formed the Healthy Weight Advisory Committee. Um, so a little bit um, about why we felt like MOCAN was um, a, a strong partner and remains a strong partner in this. Um, they've been around for 10 plus years. Um, there was a coordinator added just to, not just, but part of her function is to help with, um, with this um, Commission and also there's active there's active effort to increase the engagement of mo current MOCAM members and also um, recruit new members and uh, this is a work in progress this is too busy to look at but just to say that this was our um, our latest kind of um, overview document that tells us tells kind of how we got started what our long term goals are um, what our next steps are. And um, again, it wouldn't have been possible without, um, without funders as well as um, great partners across the state that um, provided uh, their support in terms of their, um, their faculty and staff to contribute to this effort. So um, this just kind of reviews who supported what, um, and sometimes the lines get a little, a little blurred um, because we're all, um, a number of us have interest in a number of areas. So, um, I think we're finishing a little bit early. I'd be happy to, um, to answer any questions that you might have or put you in contact with, with others that might have more knowledge about some of these specific recommendations. Yeah. I missed what you said the child care recommendation was. Okay, so it was to update the state, um, the current state licensing recommendations um, related to nutrition and physical activity practices in child care. That would include feeding practices, nutrition, physical activity, and screen time. And also to assure that the, those that are providing child care have um, the support that they need to do that. Did you have a question? Thank you. It was a very informative uh, presentation, so thanks Thank you. for doing it. Your passion is obvious for this topic. One question, or two questions actually. Um, you talked uh, somewhat extensively on Medicaid coverage for the family-based treatment. To what extent are other insurance providers, and you alluded a little bit to this, but what are other insurance providers doing in this area? My second question okay. would be, just to get it out there, would be much like autism was ultimately mandated to be, uh, mandate insurance providers to cover it. <coughs> Is that a consideration at this point? So thanks for those questions. So the first question is, how, to what extent, if at all, are other insurers engaged in this? Um, the, it's not a, to a great extent at this point. Our work has been with Missouri Medicaid and getting this off the ground. We have high interest in um, engaging other insurers. Um, we know that in our area, in the Kansas City, Missouri area, I mentioned that My Healthy Weight Initiative, the national initiative, there's a local signee on that, and that's Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield Kansas City. So they actually signed that they would, starting this year, provide um, a number of different um, clinic visits for kids as young as the age of three with obesity. I have not reached out to them yet. I intend to. Um, I have, as you can imagine, being an employee of a hospital, I have to make sure I have permission and all that. Um, and and it won't be just me. It'll you know it'll be a, a group of us um, who are really 
concerned. On the St. Louis side, Dr. Wilfley has talked with a number of commercial insurers, um, but there's been nobody, as far as I know, that has decided to kind of replicate the coverage that Medicaid is giving. And then um, related to the mandate, so how autism coverage occurred um, was first of all with commercial insurers, from what I understand, that the mandate um, was actually for commercial insurers and Medicaid came on board later. Um, Medicaid actually came on board just in the past three or four years. Um, so that, um, we are, we're watching how that happened and also what has been tracked with that because I think the concern um, among commercial payers was, you know, this is going to be too costly for us to offer. But then when they did the um, analyses of, of the costs after the benefit started um, being, being used, it ended up not being as costly. So I think we'll want to do similar um, work with um, with this benefit. So that and, and so I will just say too that that um, we tried and and we we have a great relationship with Mis with Missouri Health Net. But one of the concerns that they had is, you know, there's a lot of kids in our state insured by Medicaid that have obesity. Maybe like six hundred thousand of them. Um, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't break it down into the five to nineteen year olds. But, um, you know, how can we design a benefit that could potentially um, be delivered to all these kids and still remain cost neutral? And so, just again, um, time will tell. But our experience has been um, that even for kids that are referred to our weight management clinic, we've had it for fourteen plus years now. Weight management clinic at Children's Mercy, about seventeen percent of those kids end up going on to our group programs. So it's not a uh, one-to-one, -one. it's not, you know, these, these programs are, are good and they're evidence-based, but they also are, you know, even if they don't cost in, in finances, they cost um, families in time and in their gas to get to the program. And, you know, they may not have childcare for their other kids. And so there are a lot of other costs that families have to agree to pay for. So I don't, um, so, uh, I guess that's a long-winded answer to say that we do intend to um, to approach other insurers, and if any of you have best practices or success stories to share related to partnering with commercial insurers, I'd be really glad to hear them um, because we we need um, all the best practices that we can get um, ideally before we we make a, a pitch to them. Yes. Um, it was stated that MoHealthNet could cover treatment for children and adults. Mm -hmm. um, for the adults, is it for anyone that has full coverage Medicaid? And, and the reason I asked that is because it said it was a minimum of 12 hours for adults following a Medicare program. So, um, so thanks for that question. And, and so what I meant by the Medicare program is that the, the treatment package was modeled after what has been done for adults with Medicare. But the, the treatment benefit would be um, 12 hours that would be offered to Medicaid recipients who are adults. So um, it would be, um, it's just that the, the package itself was modeled after what's already being done for adults with Medicare. Adults with Medicaid, um, very low income, blind, disabled uh, adults that are covered by Medicaid would be offered the, that treatment package. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hey, I actually work for Cigna Healthcare um, as one of the health coaches. And Wonderful. So I think one of the things of working with an insurance company is making sure they can see they're going to save money or make money on it. Um, one of the things that Cigna actually just started January is the OMADA program. I don't know if you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. It's for any adult that is at the possibility of getting prediabetes. Most of them are overweight, so if they can actually stop people from getting diabetes, which is the same thing with childhood obesity, mm -hmm. stopping them from getting prediabetes. I think when you talk to health insurance companies, if you talk about how we can stop them from getting diabetes, um, along with that obesity, it might be a good thing. Thank you. Yeah. So I wanted to follow up on that. Um, we spent a lot of time in Kansas for a variety of grant funding and preventing the diabetes prevention mm -hmm. program. A lot of kind of a brand name for that program. I'm curious to know because the, the 12 sessions and then the 26 sessions track exactly with what Medicare has done and the Medicare diabetes prevention program. Is that what you're talking about when you say treatment in Medicare? Um, the 
the adult benefit was modeled after the Medicare IBT, which I don't think, uh, I don't, I, I think, I can say that I believe Missouri Health Net is looking separately at covering the DPP for adults um, insured by Medicaid. Um, I don't believe the actual IBT program is the DPP. Um, I think it's interesting though know, because that's really the community based sort of wraparound that you're talking about when you see all of this clinical care mm -hmm. for people um, and that's kind of how do you change your environment to better support your health too. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the challenging pieces to actually implementing DPP in Kansas has been getting providers attention and getting providers, I mean, and you said the symptoms, I don't know where to send my patients in the community. Um, the community, I think, feels the frustration that the providers don't know that. So yeah. what's the best way for us to communicate back and forth? You know, I think um, there's a variety of, of means. I think, um, you know, we, we should be doing like bi-directional outreach, uh, reach out to each other, but you know, if, if, if you know, um, you know, I, I'm thinking of, um, we've got a large primary care clinic at Children's Mercy. Um, you can reach out to me, I can get you in touch with, with the people that are the leaders there to help get the word out. Um, I think just, you know, just an email or a phone call to say, you know, I want to make sure you're aware of this. Can you provide any material? And we will ask, can you provide any materials on that, uh, ideally translated as well, um, so that we can share that with our uh, families. Um, that would be one way. I think another way would be um, in the Kansas City area, we have a community collaborative for childhood obesity called Weighing In. And that is a, a great place to come and share information that can then be taken to various um, to various sectors. So if you have a um, healthcare representation on um, any any committees or any um, meetings that you have, just you know asking them what they think the best way would be. But um, but an additional resource for for our area for kids. Um, at, at Children's Mercy is something called the Center for Community Connections, and it is actually a, um, serves as a repository for a lot of community uh, programs to get their information to so that, that that information could be shared. But a lot of it, I think, is repetition too, so don't um, be discouraged if you, you know, mention it one or two times and, and you don't get referrals. We have to hear things <laughs> over and over again, and, and honestly, we we need to share those with our colleagues um, so that the the message can be spread among the healthcare professionals. Um, an, an additional thought I had is the state level healthcare professional organizations, like I mentioned, Missouri chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. There's a similar organization for family physicians. Um, there's a Missouri Nurses Association, which would also include nurse practitioners who are primary care providers. Missouri um, also has a physician assistant um, association that you could reach out to as well to see, you know, could they send information out through their, they, a lot of them send out e-newsletters and things monthly or more often. Any other questions? Yeah. Are there any biochemical markers that, that maybe show a propensity towards obesity there are definitely biochemical markers that um, that are abnormal in kids with obesity, um, in, pre but pre-obesity, um, not that I, not that's come into mind, no, um, or any bio, you know, any kind of screening other than than their, you know, height, weight, BMI um, that would be predictive um, in terms of any kind of blood screening. Nothing's coming to my mind um, on that. Yeah. You are um, so um, forward thinking and broad thinking and public health minded with this whole um, issue of obesity, recognizing that so social determinants play a huge role. What's your sense of how how far along the pediatricians are in this state with with embracing this thinking that it that is not just you know lifestyle choices. We're in, you know, in the beginning, I think, um, but I think that that interest is mounting for sure. Um, I it, there's a lot a lot left to 
to do. And honestly, you know, there are so many health issues that pediatricians have to address in, uh, and our, our time with kids is getting shorter and shorter because the expectation is you spend like 15 or 20 minutes for a well child. And so what I'm trying to help do also is, is help take that pressure off them and, you know, say you don't have to cover all of what I would like you to cover about obesity in that time, you know, please ask them to come back. If they're interested and concerned enough, they'll come back and you can spend more of a focused clinic visit on that. Um, I, I think, you know, again, and I've been working with kids with obesity since around 1996 or so, and just, you know, watching my colleagues and all, I think that there's definitely more um, effort being made in the primary care realm, um, but I'm not out in, you know, I'm not in every area of Missouri, so I, I just see through um, through my own colleagues here, but also through the Missouri AAP, it seems like interest is mounting, and we do have a healthcare work group of MOCAN, and many of the, we don't have very many members, I'll say, to begin with, but of the members, many of them are pediatricians, <laughs> so, um, and would welcome any other healthcare professionals. Was there a question over here? Yeah. When do you anticipate that everything could possibly be in place for Medicaid to start paying? I, I wish I knew. I do believe it'll be this calendar year, but um, I, what I can tell you at this point is that um, the you know the draft rule's been published, that they got comments back, that they're um, in the process of perhaps modifying the benefit or um, you know editing it some um, before its final release. Um, yes, we have thought about it a lot. We definitely want to reach kids and families in the most effective way. Um, that being said, um, we we haven't had we have we have done s some pilots in other locations and haven't really had the uptake of the treatment program that we thought we would have. Um, that's not to say that w that it's out of our minds. That you know we still are. Um, interested in doing that and Operation Breakthrough is a specific one where we have a clinic there already um, and there are groups happening there already so we have talked with them specifically about bringing a program there. Um, the I can't say for sure on this I need to go back and look at the benefit but at least my recollection was that the initial benefit may um, I believe that the the re it's questionable in my mind. I again need to go back and look at it. It may only be reimbursed in a healthcare setting. I know we we uh, tried to get it a little more broad um, when it was being developed, but I believe that at least starting out, the the benefit may um, may be only reimbursed in a healthcare setting. Um, that being said, Missouri HealthNet has been very open to um, how can this change over time and how will it need to change over time based on the experience and the recruitment all those things that we know are more difficult um, for families um, to to navigate but if it's a place in their community that's easy and comfortable to go to we may well um, reach them better there okay thank you very much